Hi everyone. So in the last video we left off at uh, Lavoisier and the law of conservation of mass. So we're going to pick up from there and continue to talk about uh, Prouse and the law of definite proportion. We're going to do a couple of examples on this now just to uh, you know have a more concrete um, idea of how you can put the law of conservation of mass in, in practice. Okay. So uh, remember that the conservation of mass just means that the masses of things that you have before and after a chemical reaction remains exactly the same assuming that everything is done in a, in a close environment okay so no no gases or whatever that you produce can escape okay um, so we're gonna apply this in, a, in an example it's a fairly straightforward example um, it shows here that uh, you have an iron pot let's say you have a, a you know a pot that your grandmother used or your mother used you know one of these pots that's completely made of iron that's what it used to be and you put it in the kitchen countertop and over time you notice that the pot start to you know start to rust and let's say you go ahead and weigh the pot you know the masses of the pot before and after the rusting so before rusting it was 101 grams when it was there's no rust is present and then the rusted pot had a um, mass of 143 grams now based on the video the concept that we discussed in the previous video about uh, rusting we uh, remember that one of the uh, contribution of Lavoisier was that he showed that rusting is actually the same process like combustion which is basically a reaction uh, in the presence of oxygen gas. So in this case we have a reaction where iron is reacting with oxygen. So the question is what is the mass of oxygen that reacted with the iron to form the rust. Okay. So again, uh, as I mentioned before in prior videos, when whenever I do an example, what you want to be able to do is, you know, pause the video and really kind of try it out on your own first. This is why this uh, flip instruction is really uh, useful because if we do this in class we probably wouldn't have time to have you know I wouldn't have time to give you the time to work on your own because then I would need to move on with other topics but with the videos you can stop it work on your own and then check your answer because I'm gonna work through the uh, problem myself and show you how I solve it okay so stop it um, work on it and then check your answer afterwards okay so let's uh, solve this problem now so remember that before uh, rusting right the pot uh, has a mass of 101 grams and after rusting okay the mass is equal to 143 grams now rusting here is our chemical reaction okay so you can think of it here's before and then here's rusting happening okay and then here's after and so the conservation of mass is basically the mass here uh, and the mass here has to be the same now the mass are not the same but because we haven't taken into account the fact that when during the rusting process you have a certain amount of oxygen gas that reacted with the uh, iron here so then in order to figure out the mass of the oxygen gas basically the equation you need to set up is the mass of the iron before rusting right the mass of the oxygen is equal to the mass of the rust okay and then we plug in uh, we can solve for the mass of the oxygen which is just going to be the mass of rust um, minus the mass of iron so then uh, 143 grams minus 101 grams and that's equal to 42 grams and that's your answer okay so that should be hopefully fairly straightforward for uh, all of you to work. Okay, so now we're going to go to the second law that's also important in the development of the theory of uh, the atom, okay, the uh, atomic theory. And this is the law of definite proportion, or a lot of times this is also called the law of constant composition. Okay, so it's the same meaning, uh, both of these laws. The idea, uh, what this is telling us is basically that... Um, in if you have a, a particular um, compound okay for example calcium carbonate in this case whether you obtain the calcium carbonate from you know statues or whether you get the calcium carbonate from sea um, rocks for example or uh, some sea structures you know that you can go under underneath the sea like corals and and whatnot where they also contain calcium carbonate what uh, 
people have found, specifically Prowse, was the person who discovered this uh, first time, he found that whether you get the calcium carbonate from one source or the other source, which is completely different from each other, it turns out that the mass percentage okay, of the calcium, the carbon, and the oxygen, which are the three elements that make up calcium carbonate, is always the same. So in this case, for calcium carbonate specifically, it's always going to be 40 mass percent of calcium, 12 mass percent of carbon, and 48 mass percent of oxygen regardless of where you get the um, calcium carbonate sample from, okay? So, um, another example is shown right here, okay? So, how do you determine this mass percent uh, composition? So, it's fairly straightforward. So, let me just kind of show you an example right here. Um, you can, for example, collect a sample of uh, malachite, which is a mineral, uh, that's composed of copper, carbon, and oxygen, okay? And if you were to, again, uh, collect sample of malachite from different continents, let's say Africa, Asia, Europe, and the Americas, uh, you can collect different samples. They all have different masses. And then you can, what you can do is you can take this and you can decompose it, okay? So decompose is a, is a word that uh, has a special meaning here. It means that you're taking it and you're heating it down to its uh, elements, okay? So you break it down into its elements and then you weigh each of these elements. So you get these masses right here, okay? So how do we show, uh, in this case, that all the malachites from all these different locations have the same uh, percent mass composition? Okay, so we'll work on this uh, on the next slide. Uh, keep these numbers in mind, okay? Now, you can again try this ahead of time, ahead of me. Try to calculate the percent, uh, mass percent composition of each of these elements. Okay, so um, let's look back again at this uh, data that we had earlier. I'm just going to rewrite parts of this, which is just the total mass of the malachite and then the mass of the copper that was uh, decomposed from the malachite, okay? So you find that um, you know all of these all all of these uh, uh, samples have a certain amount of copper in them, and what you want to do now is basically figure out something called the percent mass of copper in the malachite. Okay, in the malachite here in the mineral. So how do you do that? Well, the way you do this is fairly straightforward. If you think about it, if I want to figure out how much of copper is in the total, then it's really just a matter of taking this number and dividing it by that number, right? That's just kind of a definition of a fraction if you think about it. So the mass percent, therefore, of copper is just going to be, in general, the mass of copper, right, that you get from the decomposition divided by the mass of the malachite that you have. In this case, um, you know, your, your, your sample is the malachite, but you can make this the compound, okay? And then, because we want to express this as a percentage, we're going to multiply this by 100%, okay? So let's try to do this for, um, you know, one of the, uh, one of the uh, sample uh, from Africa, let's say, okay? So if we do this from Africa, okay, so from Africa, Right, the data would then tell us that percent copper should be 12.3 grams because that's how much copper we have divided by uh, 23.91 grams times 100 percent. If you do that calculation uh, in a calculator, you should get 51.4 percent. Okay, so I'm going to put that number right here, 51.4 percent. And you can do all of these ones as well. And I'm going to do that right now and then just write down the numbers. Okay, so um, I just calculated this uh, percent composition by mass for all the other samples from all the other continents. And you notice that the numbers 51.4, 51.4, 51.5, they're all about the same right, like the first one. In fact, they're either the same or just only a little bit difference, okay, which is a small difference here. Um, so that's what it means to have the uh, law of definite proportion. You basically have the same uh, percent composition of the element regardless of where the source of the element is, okay? So that's an important idea to understand uh, at this point. And there's a couple of reasons why this is important. The first is written right here, which is that 
what this tells us is that the composition of a substance, okay, uh, which is remember that you know at that time people didn't know that that things are composed of atoms, right? But what it suggests is whatever makes up the atom, I mean whatever makes up the the material that you have, is independent of origin, and this is really uh, something that um, disprove uh, Aristotle's theory of the four essences because you know based on Aristotle's theory depending on whether you get your sample you know near a lake or whether you get the sample you know in an area that's very dry the amount of essences you're gonna get is not going going to be the same as a result the material is not gonna be the same right but what this calculation that we just did has proven uh, is that even though we're getting things from very very different locations it turns out that the percent composition of the element is still the same okay so that tells us that we you know have to look at uh, at, at uh, matter a little bit differently perhaps it's not through the four essences but perhaps through some other ways of describing how matter is composed of another way to um, uh, another important idea that we um, concluded from the law of definite proportion is that now this allows us to di differentiate between what we consider as a compound versus a mixture so if you remember from the previous topic topic one when we talk about the difference between a compound and a mixture we say that a mixture is something that contains more than one pure substance so for example sand and water is a mixture whereas a compound would be just water alone or sand alone right um, so a mixture has many compounds in them or has many elements could be either a combination of compounds or a combination of compound and elements um, it, a mixture is not going to have it's not going to follow the law of definite proportion because within the mixture you have several different compounds so then you're going to have different proportion of those compounds but the uh, a compound would always follow the law of definite proportion because a compound like H2O would always be composed of two hydrogen and one oxygen by mass so even though you get your water from the lake or from the well or from the river you're always going to have the same proportion of those elements okay so it's an important uh, discovery that allows us to distinguish between the definition of a compound and a mixture because before that again people didn't know what's a compound and what's a mixture and now they can differentiate between these two terms